Welcome back to Wednesday Night Live at Dorset Shoals as we continue walking through our book about being a peacemaker in a world that is so conflicted and so challenging right now. We need peacemakers and we need Christians to be peacemakers. Well, this is our third lesson, and as you saw with the title, this is going to be talking about going and showing. This is where we're going to go to the person and actually show them their fault, show them the, the, the result of the conflict or what is causing conflict between the two of you or what may be something in their life that shouldn't be there. So this is the tough one. This is the one where we look at and say, ooh, this is going to be the difficult one. Because as we've looked in the past, in the last two lessons, the first lesson we looked and we saw how conflict can glorify God, how we look and we see how God can use conflict to grow people to you know, bring honor to himself, bring glory to himself, that by following his ways, we were able to get through this, by uh, being able to serve other people, by showing them our faults, by showing them, hey, this is something you shouldn't be doing or something in your life that's causing problems. And then it also showed us how it can help us to grow to be more Christ-like as we seek to help other people and to get conflict out of our life. Last week, we talked about examining ourselves, about making sure what is our attitude, what's our feelings about the situation, uh, counting that cost of conflict. What's it going to cost this conflict that we are engaged in? Is it something that we can overlook or do we need to continue to proceed further? Then also how we freed ourselves from sin's grip through confession. How sometimes we got to remember, you know, hey, we can be at fault too. This is not just about another person, but maybe sometimes the problems we have. So today as we look at it, we're again going to look at this process of going and showing our neighbors. This is the actual nuts and bolts of conflict and how we get through this. So we want to go ahead and kind of take a look at it and really see about what are we to do, what are we trying to do when it comes to conflict resolution. Well, the first thing we want to see and make sure that we're doing is that we are restoring the sinner. In Galatians 6.3, it says this, Brethren, even if any if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one look into yourself so that you too will not be tempted. You know, when we think about restoration before anything else, I think that's a big thing about this. We're not trying to destroy our opponent. We're not trying to destroy someone we might disagree with. We're trying to restore them, to restore them to where God would have them to be. And so we who are spiritual, Spiritual, those who are claiming to follow Jesus Christ, we should seek restoration, not domination. And I think that's what goes on in our world today. I want to win the argument and humiliate the opponent. It's not just that, you know, I win, they must lose. Well, that's not the idea of the Christian. The Christian is we should look and restore the other person, not try to destroy the other person. Well, a couple of ways that we're going to need to kind of see and really kind of understand this is how do we do this? How do, when is justifiable conflict? When can we look and say this is something that needs to happen because of this? Well, a couple of things we need to do to understand, yes, I can't overlook this. I need to go into conflict resolution with this person. A couple of things that we need to look at. Well, the first thing, is when someone has something against you. And yes, I said that exactly right. When someone has something against you, that's a time for us to go into restoration, conflict resolution. In Matthew 5, 23 through 24, it says this, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go first. Be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Now, the thing that's important to note, you notice it doesn't say that he has something justifiable against you. No, he's just saying he has something against you. And again, I think what God's showing us here is the importance of our interpersonal relationships because we need to make sure, especially in a body of believers, that we're doing this. Even if our brother has something against us, we need to go and say, hey, is everything okay? Are we okay? You know, because when we do that, when we make that effort to say, you know, before I go any further, I'm going to try to reconcile with this because I think they might have something against me. It does a couple of things. You know, it promotes unity in the body. If both are Christians, we need to have unity because Satan would love nothing more than to cause disunity. It will enhance your Christian witness. Because when someone sees and sees that you handle it as a Christian, you said, you know what, the Bible says this, I want to go do this because that's what the Bible tells me to do, it can enhance your Christian witness to someone else. It can give you a peace of mind. I mean, we've all been there where you think, you know, I think so-and-so might not, he might have something against me. He, he's not pleased with me right now. You know, some of us had those sleepless nights wondering about those. But when we know and we say, I'm going to handle it as God would have me to handle it, it gives us peace of mind. And then also, it might can show someone their fault. 
you know, there may be a problem where they come up and they have something against you. And then you say, wait a minute, this is what happened. Oh, I didn't know that. You know, or it shows them they might have a false thinking. They might have believed something that wasn't true. Or maybe there's just something going on. And so the first thing we need to look at to say, yeah, we, we need conflict resolution is if someone has something against you. The second thing we look at is when the sin cannot be overlooked. You know, as we talked about a couple of weeks or last week, you know, God wants us to overlook minor sins. You know, we overlook these things because if we call out every little thing that offends me or upsets me, we're going to be just really pulling our hair out, which, I mean, we see that going on in our world today. But when a sin cannot be overlooked, we need to make sure that, yeah, we, we're going to have to bring this up. We're going to have to have this conflict. And so how do we know if this is something that cannot be overlooked? Well, the first thing, is it dishonoring God? Is this bringing dishonor to God? That's why if we look and we see somebody who is, their actions are bringing dishonor to God, to his word, to his church, that it needs to step up and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's a problem here. You know, this is not what you should be doing because this brings dishonor to God. That needs to be, confl that conflict needs to be done. Is it damaging your relationship? Now, again, this is not a careless comment that's forgotten about a few you know, minutes later or maybe even a few days later. This is something that has altered your relationship with that person and maybe even their perception of that person. Where you look and say, you know what, this happens so much that I don't know if I can get over this. I don't know if this is something that can keep going. I've got to get this fixed. So is it damaging a relationship that needs to be handled? Is it hurting others? You know, of course, if we find out about abuse of other people or, you know, elderly abuse, child abuse, things of that nature, behavior that might cause others to engage in that behavior, you know, someone's doing something and, you know, they're pulling other people along with them, you know, we need to make sure and step up and say, wait a minute, this has got to be handled. This is hurting other people. Um, is it hurting the offender? is another reason why we should jump in with conflict sometimes. You know, if they're doing something that's going to abuse themselves, you know, throughout the years, you've heard about, you know, the interventions for someone with alcohol problems, you know, that the family gets together and says, you're hurting yourself and we're not going to stand around and let this happen. Um, so when you look at these things, you look at these four things, you say, okay, yeah, I can see these are things that we really just can't let go. We just can't overlook. We've got to really address them. But I think there's a word of caution here. A word of caution I would say to you is this, is that, you know, avoid looking for faults to point out. You know, I think one of the problems that sometimes can happen um, in a spiritually immature person is they look for everything and they try to make it a big deal. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, they didn't come to church last Sunday. That hurts the body of God. Church discipline. Whoa, wait a minute now. Come on. That's, wait a minute. Let's not grow crazy. You know, stuff like that. Because sometimes people can get really caught up in, let me look for every little minor thing. Make it a really big hill that we need to go conflict with. And, and that just brings more conflict uh, instead of just overlooking it like we should have. But conversely, we should not ignore um, potential problems. You know, that's one of the things. We, we ride this fine line of, you know, don't go overboard on everything, but don't just treat everything like overlook everything. And so you have to really gauge this in a couple of things. Like I said, you can look at these things. Is it dishonoring God? Is it damaging your relationship? Is it hurting other people? Is it hurting the offender themselves? And you can look at that and it kind of gives you a guideline there. Now, there are some special considerations when kind of coming to, you know, conflict with a person. Uh, number one, are they a non-Christian? You know, now that doesn't mean that you're not going to hold them accountable or say, hey, wait a minute, there's an issue here, but you're going to handle it a little differently. You're not just going to say, okay, hey, you're, you know, you're done, you know, everything like that. But you're going to handle it differently because you know, okay, this is a non-Christian. Why am I surprised when I act like a non-Christian? You know, and so I need to make sure I give special consideration to that, how I handle it. I'm going to handle it very differently if it's a person is a professing believer in Christ versus someone who does not. A uh, second thing, if the person is an authority figure. You know, um, if it's a, you know, someone in authority, some, a pastor per se, or a church leader, Sunday school leader, or maybe your boss at your job, things of that nature, you're going to handle it differently. Now, again, doesn't excuse it. You don't say, well, they're the boss, so I can't say anything. And there's no pastor alive that should say that either. You know, I can make mistakes just like anybody else. But the big thing about it is you're going to come and you're going to choose your words again carefully. You're going to give respect and honor to who they are. You're not just going to come in there and, you know, treat them like, oh, well, you're my subordinate. So, whoa, wait a minute now. God has placed them in authority. Treat it and do it accordingly. And then also with some considerations, you need to go tentatively and repeatedly. You know, one of the things we need to understand, many conflicts and misunderstandings are not actual uh, misdeeds. What, what they are are, you know, misunderstandings. 
you know, this, I think this way, I thought this way. And then we come together and it's like, oh, we need to think this way. You know, so it's one of these things I think is a really big deal where we understand, you know, we don't have to go into conflict with our boxing gloves on. We need to go in with our listening ears on. They were saying, okay, how is this misunderstanding? How can we get on the same page? We're not on the same page right now. How can we get on the same page? But go tentatively. Go with the attitude of, uh, you know, and, and uh, excuse me, go with this attitude, not an accusing attitude. You know, when we go into the attitude of this person's wrong automatically, they have nothing that can say, I'm nowhere near possibly wrong, that can be you know, a very bad thing. Go with this idea of, okay, I'm going to think the best, I'm going to think of this, and it's just a misunderstanding that we can get through this. Give the person the benefit of the doubt. You know, unfortunately, in our world, people don't get that. You know, it's like, you said this, you're done. And it's like, whoa, wait a minute, you don't understand what happened or anything like that. So the first thing we see here is, you know, we want to restore the center. That's the ultimate goal of what is going on in conflict, to restore them, to, or to restore the relationship maybe between the person, restore them with God, restore us with that person, restore us with God. I mean, that's what it is, is we seek conflict. First thing needs to be restoration. All right, so I've got a couple of questions here for you, so just listen up on these questions. Do you have reason to believe that someone might have something against you? When you look and say, I don't know, someone might have something against me. But then the second question about that, how can you think this through without giving into paranoia? Because I think a lot of us could sit there and say, oh, well, I think, you know, oh, they must. So you find yourself going to every single person. Do you have something wrong with you? Do you have a problem? Do you have... How can we go through this without giving into paranoia? Second question, what keeps us from confronting people? No, I'm sorry. I'm not going to do that question. That's going to be a little later. Okay, and then the second question, how does understanding that most conflicts arise from misunderstandings rather than outright wrongs help your attitude about conflict? All right, so I'll talk about that for just a moment. We'll be right back. As we continue on, I'm going to kind of jump right in because we got a lot one to cover in this segment. We talked about restoring, that conflict should restore the center. Well, the second thing it should do is we should make sure that when we are in conflict, we speak the truth in love. In Ephesians 4, 15, it says this, But speaking the truth in love, so we are to grow up in all aspects unto him who is the head, even Christ. You know, we need to make sure that we're speaking when we come into conflict with somebody or conflict resolution with somebody, that we're speaking to build them up, not to drag them down. We're not trying to get revenge upon them. We're not trying to destroy the other person. You know, we've seen this happen, you know, in high school, you know, you, when you saw friends fight, it was so ugly. 
You know, and you don't want to see those things. And so we need to come at it with speaking the truth and love no matter what, because a careless word can destroy the reconciliation process before it even begins. We say something careless or something silly or something not really thinking through it. It can be really bad. And so we need to make sure we speak the truth in love. The second thing is we need to be quick to listen. You know, if we could just be quick to listen, that would really help us. And some ways that we can be quick to listen are as follows. Number one, wait while they talk. You know, we've all been there where we're trying to talk to somebody and maybe it's a serious conversation. But when you're talking, you can tell they're not really listening. They're just waiting to jump in. They've already made their mind up. And so they're, they're kind of jumping over you and talking. And you're in the middle of a thought. And they're like, well, here. it's like, wait a minute, let them talk. Wait till they've stopped. You may even get to the point and say, okay, have you finished? Can, you know, I don't want to interrupt you. Can I talk now? You want to do it that way so that they know that, hey, you're waiting because you respect them. You want them to know what we're talking about is important and I need to hear everything that you do. And conversely, if you interrupt them, you also give them permission to interrupt you when you're talking. So wait for them to talk. Um, number one, focus on the, per or excuse me, number two, focus on the person's words. You know, professionals of this call this attending, that you're attending their conversation. You're focusing on the person's word. Give them your full attention. You know, one of the things that I think has uh, really been aggravating uh, to a lot of people recently is when people are talking to you, it's an important conversation, and they're writing on the phone, or they're checking out their text, or they're just looking at their phone. It's like, put that phone down, turn off the radio, put, turn off the TV, whatever you got to do, but make sure that you're giving them their full attention and focus on their words and their emotions of what they're saying. Because when you really key in that, that can really help. The uh, third thing is to clarify, make sure you understood what they're saying. You know, it, it's not one of these, it's not a disrespectful thing for you to say, wait a minute, I didn't catch that. Can you say that again? You might also say, you know, are you saying such and such? Uh, tell me more about what happened. Um, I'm a little confused about what you just said. That's okay to do that. Again, it shows the person that you're really paying attention and you really want to reconcile. It's not just a matter of, I just want to speak my piece and I'm right and you're wrong. You know, and so we need to make sure we're doing that, clarify. The, another uh, way you can do this, the fourth thing, is to reflect. What this is, is summarizing and paraphrasing. So what you might say is, okay, so if I understand you correctly, the way you see this is such and such. If I understand you correctly, this is what's going on. So what you're saying is this. Words like that can really help to understand it. Does that person say, yes, that's exactly what I'm feeling. Now, they may also say, no, that's not what I'm feeling at all. And you can say, well, hey, come back with me on this. But the thing is, be prepared to be corrected. You know, they may say, no, that's not what I feel at all. Are you even listening? Say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because you may not be on the same thought path with that person. You know, so the thing is to make sure that you're listening to them and reflecting and paraphrasing and understanding that you may have a different thought process than they do. So make sure you don't try to say, well, you shouldn't have been upset about that. Well, if they are upset about it, they are upset about that, whether you think they should be or not. So make sure that you really reflect those and give that to them. Um, and then try to agree, you know, agree with what they have said. You know, this is especially true if you're in the wrong. You know, you know, give them this idea of agreeing. You know, if, if they point out something to you and you can say to them, you know what, you're right. I was wrong when I said that. I shouldn't have done that. I can understand why you feel this way. That you give them this agreement in order to say, you know what, you're right. You know, that can help to really get some good conversation going. Now, one caveat I would give to you, this does not mean that you make things up or that you abandon your beliefs to foster a false agreement. If it's not a, a true agreement, you know, it's, it, you don't just sit there and say it to say it. Because if you're like, okay, yeah, I was supposedly wrong, blah, 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 but I'm still going to not change because I really don't think I'm wrong, that's not agreeing. You're just placating, and don't placate, okay? So make sure you're doing that. So that's one of the things we need to make sure we're doing is be quick to listen to the person. You know, don't say, and you know, oh, well, you're not, you, your feelings aren't valid, but be quick to listen to them. Eye contact, make sure that you're really involved in the conversation. And then the second thing, or excuse me, yeah, the third thing you need to make sure you're speaking uh, to build them up, not tear them down. You're being quick to listen. And then the second thing, you need to have wise communication. You know, there's healing that comes from wise communication. And what this looks like, number one, choose the right time and place. You know, if you know there's a conflict, if you know there's something going on, you know, there's times that you need to say, yes, we need to look at this. It may not be right then. A lot of time, and I know guys, we have a tendency, we want to fix it, we want to fix it now. 
But sometimes it's better to say, you know what, we're not going to be able to fix it right now. So what we're going to do is we will talk later. You know, hey, let's set this up. Let's talk tomorrow. Conversely, don't sit there and say, okay, we'll talk about it sometime next week and then just try to let it go away. That can be very detrimental. So a person with wise communication, they choose the right time and place for this. Um, another thing about wise communication is that they're going to believe the best about others. You know, in the world today, this is such a negative. You know, people look at it and say, no, no, people are trying to take advantage of you. People are going to do this. People are doing that. And it's like you can never get to that point of saying, no, I'm going to believe the best about them. I'm going to trust them. I'm not going to just say they're guilty and they're proven innocent. No, they're innocent until proven guilty. And so make sure that you believe the best about others. Talk in person. I think one of the things we have an issue with nowadays is I'll just call them. I'll just text them. I'll just email them. You know, it, it's, it's one of these things where I'm afraid that that shows an impersonality to it. And also it, it's one of these things where I think people do this because they think that that'll help them. But in actuality, I think that's more detriment. Talk to the person in person. This is important, and we need to meet face-to-face -face so that I can see every nuance, that you can see my feelings, you can see my emotions, and that can't come through on a text or um, email, things of that nature. Uh, the third thing, or fourth thing, is plan your words. You know, look at this and say, okay, what am I going to say? What do I want to make sure I get out? Now, the one caveat I'd give you there is don't try to script it. Because they may give you something that, you know, okay, I wasn't expecting that, and that's not in my script, so I don't know what to do. You know, so you want to know it, but know what you want to say. Know what you want to get out and say, hey, these are the issues, these four issues I want to cover, you know, and things of that nature. So be prepared to hear those things. Okay, and then when you look at it, another thing that you need to do is when you're in conflict and you're trying to help this is use I statements. And what I mean by that is I statements like I feel blank when blank happens. I feel frustrated when you fail to keep commitments, you know, things of that nature where you make it personal. This is not some nebulous thing that's just, you know, the universe crashing upon this person. No, this is between us. And I feel this way when this happens, you know, and the good thing about it there is that helps us to not negate the person because a lot of times, what do we do? Oh, well, they shouldn't have felt that way. Well, if they say, I feel this way, they feel this way, whether you think it's justifiable or not. But it gives you an understanding of no and helps them to understand where you're coming from as well. Uh, the th another one is to be objective. Avoid generalizations and exaggerations. I've told Ryan a million times, don't exaggerate. Okay, I've not really told Ryan a million times, don't exaggerate. But you see what I'm saying. You know, don't try to avoid the generalizations. You are always late for work. I do everything around the house. Everybody is saying this about you. Avoid those because those don't do anything but inflame the situation. Use the Bible carefully. Another one is use the Bible carefully. Don't use the Bible as a battering ram. There's been a lot of people who have done that, you know, and, and I can show you one real quickly. You know, wives submit to your husband, okay? Wives, you like that one? Okay, you know, but husbands submit to your wives as to everything. And that's, that's Ephesians 5.21. Both of you are to submit to one another. And husbands, you're to give your life for your wife. But we've seen people use wives submit to your husbands as a battering ram. Do not use the Bible as a battering ram. You know, use it in context and only in right situations. You know, of course, it's very good to bring the Bible in, to use, and here's what God wants from us. But do not use it as a battering ram to try to get your point across. You know, use it as a guide, not as a battering ram. Um, the last one, or not the last one, the second to last one, um, ask for feedback. You know, you want to make sure that both understand what the other's been saying. You know, it may follow a phrase of, you know, have I confused you on this? I want to make sure we're, we're getting this down. Um, have I explained myself clearly enough? You know, I want to make sure you're seeing everything I want you to see. Uh, what have I said that you would agree or disagree with? You know, so you try to get that feedback. Another one is to offer solutions and preferences. You know, to be able to say, well, this is how I think we should reconcile this. You know, most people want to solve the situation. There's very few people who want to sit there and say, nope, I love this conflict. No, most people say, oh, well, I want to figure out how to settle this as well. So you may say something like, you know, I would prefer to renegotiate the contract rather than just void it. Um, my first choice would be for us to get together and discuss dad's will rather than over the phone. Uh, what do you think about what this is? You know, stuff like that. So offer some suggestions. And then the last thing is recognize your limits. Uh, you cannot force change on another person. You may come to the end of this conflict or, or the end of the discussion and then be like, yeah, I don't care. I feel the exact same way that I did before. There's nothing you can do about that. Nothing you can say, okay, well, we'll just do whatever. There's nothing you can do about it. Because why? Because only God can change hearts. 
you know, only God can change the heart. You just might be the mouthpiece that he uses to change that person's heart. So the big thing is to be praying and saying, Lord, I need you to lead this conversation. I need you to lead this and guide this and guide this person to where you would have them to be, not where I would have them to be. All right. So I know that was kind of a quick, a lot of information there, but got a couple of questions for you. Number one, when you talk to or about your opponent, what might you be tempted to say that would be harmful and worthless? You know, when you're in conflict with somebody, a lot of things Satan wants us to do is, yeah, just tell them, you know, belittle them. How can that be such a detriment? And the second question, what could you say that would clearly communicate you love and your love and concern for your opponent? What's something you could say or do that would show them, hey, I love them, Gary. I want good things to come out of this. All right? So I'll talk about that for just a moment. We'll be right back. So when we look at the conflict, you've examined yourself, you've looked at this, you've gone through all of these, you've used the nice statements, you've agreed, you've tried to do all these things, you've extolled the person, you've really done all this, and they're just like, yeah, we ain't finished. You know, this is like, nope, this isn't satisfactory. They may say, okay, well, I don't care anymore, so this is done, I'm not going to change, so what do you do? Well, we know that the Bible does talk about this and how the Bible says, you know, when you do this, you know, and something doesn't happen, what do you do next? Well, the Bible would tell us to take one or two along with you. In Matthew 18, 16, it says this, but if it does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. So we see the scripture talking about this resolution process. I think it's an important thing for us to kind of step back and look and see in Matthew 18, um, and you'll see it up on your board here, what exactly is he talking about here? What is the process for going through this? Well, the first thing is to overlook minor offenses. You know, God's like, is this a hill to die on? Is this something, you know, do you need to give up your rights for this in order that you might have peace and unity with your fellow believer? So it may be overlooked at minor offense. Then it moves to talk in person, where we just covered that in the last segment, where we talk in person. And again, the goal is reconciliation to build them up, to help them to see their fault, maybe even for you to see the fault that you might have. And then the final segment here is to take one or two others along with you. Where you say, okay, I'm willing to get someone else. I'm willing to get, you know, maybe the pastor, maybe a deacon, maybe another respected Sunday school leader, maybe another respected leader in the church who's going to come and help with this. Now, the thing about it is you need to have a mutual agreement upon this. So if you're in conflict with this person and you're saying, you know what, we're not getting anywhere together. Is it okay if I bring my pastor? If it's, you know, and if you're both church members, hey, we need to bring pastor, in our case, Pastor Steve along. We need to bring, you know, Deacon David in, you know, something like that. It needs to be mutual agreement. 
because it doesn't seem to be like, you know, yeah, well, I'm bringing my boys, you bring your boys. You know, we don't want that to look like that. And so it's this mutual agreement. Now we say, well, what if the person says, no, I don't want to meet with them? Well, you shouldn't force it because they're going to come in with an air of hostility. But you may say to the person, okay, well, I'm going to talk to Pastor Steve and I'm going to talk to David and help and, and get their thoughts and what I need to do and how, because I want to reconcile this and I need more because it's not working just you and I. And so there's a good way to do that is to take that one or two. You know, if they don't agree, say, hey, I'm going to do it. But you're not doing it in secret, you know, to where it's like, well, okay, well, we won't do it. And then you go talk to Pastor Steve and then your next meeting. Well, me and Pastor Steve met and he said, you're all wrong. You know, you don't want to do that. Okay, so the thing is you take that one or two, one or two along with you. And what if that doesn't work? Well, if that doesn't work, the person's like, well, I don't care. I don't care what y'all say. Then you take it to the church. And the thing about it is this, and I think this is where it's, it's such a big deal, because when it's all about telling it to the church, this is not a public event. This is not where, you know, okay, hey, I know we just now finished up our sermon series and everything like that, but we, before y'all go, we need to tell you something about brother whatever. You know, we don't need to do it that way. But it does need to be an, uh, tell the church leadership. You know, now you may have your deacon and pastor already involved in this, so they may know it already. Uh, the group that the person is involved with, it may need to go to Sunday school and say, hey, so-and-so, your Sunday school class is doing such and such. They're not reconciliating. They're not repentant about it, so other activities are going to happen. And the purpose of this, and I think that's the big deal about it, the purpose of this is to have pressure for more people on this person. You know, that they would see that, hey, we love you, we care about you, and this is detrimental to your life. This is detrimental to your walk with God. We don't hate you. We don't dislike you, but we want you to see this. And it's more than just that person who has brought it to your attention. It's more than Pastor Steve and the deacon who were in that meeting, too. It's a lot of us who are saying this is not good. And so, again, this isn't a public thing. It's not you air it out and say, hey, we're going to have a special YouTube post on so-and-so. We're not doing that. But it is one where the church does need to be aware from it. Now, what if they, with that and, you know, the Sunday school people and the people say, hey, this isn't, hey, brother, you need to get this right. This is wrong. What if it said, well, I don't care. I'm not doing that either. Well, what does it say? Treat him as an unbeliever. And this is where we have such a hard time because it is this disfellowship where it's like, okay, you, you can't be here no more. You're not a member of our church anymore. You know, we need you to step aside. We need you to, to move on. Because you're not doing what we have you to do. We're not doing what the Lord would have you to do. You're bringing dishonor upon his name. You're bringing dishonor upon his church and his word. So we're going to have to ask you to step out. You know, and the thing that's tough about this is you love the person. You don't want them to leave. You want them to be there. You want them to expose themselves to the word of God, that they might be what God would have them to be. But understand that, you know what, just like any kind of discipline that a parent gives to their child is done out of love. We're doing this not because we hate you or dislike you. We're doing this because we want good things in your life. And because you're doing these things, good things aren't going to happen in your life. And so we need to be very wary of that. So when we, there is an idea of disfellowship, a couple of things that it does. Number one, it avoids dishonoring the Lord, where people can look and say, okay, yeah, there is a criteria. There is a standard that we need to live up to. And God has dictated it, and we're going to follow what God has told us to do. If we're not doing it, we can dishonor the Lord. The second thing, it protects others from a bad example, where it's like, oh, well, they're doing it, so I can do it too. You know, okay, well, no one has a problem with them doing it, so I can do this too. And so we have to be aware of that. And then also it can bring pressure on the person to repent, where we look and the person says, you know what, you were right. I was wrong, and I need to do something. I can give you an example of this at a church we served at. There was a man who was doing something wrong. Uh, Pastor Stan, he followed these things. The man was like, nope, I'm not changing. I'm not going to do it. He was disfellowshipped. It was, I remember it was a Sunday night activity that we did um, where it wasn't a large group. It was really kind of a lot of the people who were just part of this. And they were, uh, he was disfellowshipped. Um, and Pastor Stan, I can remember Pastor Stan telling us, you know, treat him as an unbeliever. Now, not in a negative way, but in a way of we pray for the unbeliever. We pray for God to do his will in their life and for them to fall in line with that. But also, hey, you know, you got to step back. You know, this is your, you hesitate to say you're not welcome here, but you're not following what God will have you to do. And so it was interesting because after a few months, suddenly this man came back to Pastor Stan and said, you were right, I was wrong. He came up on a Sunday morning and apologized to the church and repented of his behavior. So you saw where church discipline actually worked and did this. And so it was such a good thing because the man was reconciled to God, reconciled to the church, and because of that, this man's life really took off a lot. And so it was a really neat thing. 
So we need to make sure that we do this. So we see these things. We see the steps of Matthew 18. Now, one of the questions that we have, and we talked about it earlier about believers not, a couple of weeks ago, about believers not going to court against one another. You know, when you've got two believers who are, you know, in a trial, man, they should be able to take that to the church and figure it out. They should be able to use the scriptures to figure it out. But what happens when it's a non-believer? You know, even if it's this situation where it was a church member who, you know, is not doing it God's way, you know, is there a time to take to court? Well, what the book was talking about, if the situation has arisen, that the person has been disfellowshipped from the church, the legal action can be pursued because they are not a member of church in good standing. It's one of these things where you look and you say, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. They're not obeying God. And so, yeah, if this has to be, you know, they're, they're obviously not listening to the church anyway because they're not doing what the church would say in reconciliation. So, yeah, legal action, if it's something legal that has to happen, this is not just a little personal issue, but if it's a legal thing, then, yeah, you can do that. However, one of the things that it kind of points to it is are the rights that you're trying to win in court biblically legitimate? You know, are you trying to get something, you know, just out of this that the Bible would say, wait a minute, you know, you're not seeking reconciliation, you're just seeking recompense. You you don't really care about the person's emotions and reconciling with the person, you just want them to pay. You know, would that be biblically legitimate? You know, I think in some cases, probably not. You know, should they pay for something if they've, you know, broken your house or your car or something? Yes. But the thing about it is make sure that what you're seeking in the, the court is biblically legitimate if you're going to do that. So we see this, you know, this is, a, this is one of these things where we see, you know, we don't like conflict to go this way, but God has a plan for it and God has a way to settle it. And it goes pretty far-fetching. So, okay, got a couple more questions here uh, for your last time of questions. See what it says. It says this, what would you say to someone to encourage them to allow other people to meet with the two of you to help resolve an issue. Okay, what would you say to them? You know, because you want to make sure you're combating that idea, of, oh, y'all are just ganging up. You're going to bring your people in, you know, something like that. So how do you do that? And then the second thing, why do people have such a hard time confronting people about issues? What is building your, oh, excuse me, what is holding you back from confronting someone? When you look and say, okay, wait a minute, what's holding me back from this? What's keeping me from confronting someone? All right, so y'all talk about that for just a moment. We'll be right back with our final segment. Right. Well, as we look at this and we've seen this one, again, this was the nitty gritty. This was the one that really kind of put us face to face with the person we're in conflict with. Most people don't like conflict. 
you know, it's one of these things we look at, we see it in our world, and we just see, you know, unfortunately, we see some people who do like conflict, but most people don't. Most people say, you know, it's a misunderstanding, and we just want to get it worked out. And again, what do we think? I think it goes back to something we said two weeks ago, where it talked about this idea of, you know, who are we truly seeking to please? Are we trying to please our own thoughts, our own desires? Are we trying to please God? Are we trying to please the other person? You know, when we're in conflict, again, it's important for us to remember this is a misunderstanding that needs to be dealt with, and we need to make sure how we can do that. So one of the ways we do that is, again, by making sure we go to the person. We pick that right time. And we say, hey, let's get this settled. Let's not let this fester, not so let this keep going, but let's get this settled. And you, again, you look at that person. You look at them with respect and honor. You don't try to just dismiss them totally and say, ah, you know, forget them and everything like that. No, you want to believe and trust in what they're doing so that you can get there. But again, we see this, people don't like conflict, but conflict can be a natural part of our lives. We know that. There's going to be conflict in our lives. So what we need to do is handle it and handle it properly in God's way. All right, let's have a word. Dear Father God, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we know conflict is a challenge. Lord, you, you experience conflict. Lord, you experience the conflict that so many of us give you every day by trying to do it our way instead of yours. But Lord, I pray that you would just help us, Lord, that we would seek to be what you would have us to be, even in the midst of conflict. That, Lord, we would seek to be people who would reconcile, people who would try to help other people, people who would try to help a situation, not make it worse. And, Lord, that means for us to take a step back. If we're a Christian, help us to take that step back the same way that you did. Lord, you were justified in all your actions, but yet, Lord, you stepped back so that we might be justified that we might be justified with the Father. Lord, I pray that you would help us to make sure that we don't demand our rights, but, Lord, that we demand to do what you would have us to do. And, Lord, that that would mean that we, we confront people. And, again, you've shown us the way to do it. First we go in private, then we take someone else, and then the church, and then this fellowship if we have to. And, Lord, you, we see how you want it each step to be about restoring the person, not destroying the person. So, Lord, I pray that as we come across conflict uh, in our personal lives, in our business lives, in our church lives, Lord, help us to always deal with it as you would have us to deal with it, in person with the person, not trying to hide it, not trying to ignore it, but, Lord, dealing with it so that we might present a unified body moving forward with you. Lord, again, I thank you for this time. Lord, pray that you would be with us during our conflicts and lead us and guide us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, thank you for joining us today and being a part of this. We'll uh, be back next week with another segment from this book, which I think is doing a really good thing. Hope that you will come and join us in our church. We've got um, a lot of great things coming up. Uh, we've got our Sunday morning service that is going to be uh, we do 930. We have Sunday school classes for all ages. At 11 o'clock, we have our worship service, and I hope that you'll be a part of that. If you can't make it in person, come by and see us online, as we'll have our service online as well. But again, know that conflict's going to come into our lives, but God has a plan for conflict and a way for us to reconcile with each other through conflict. All right, so y'all get out there. And let's talk with each other, love each other, and care about each other. All right, see you next week.